And today, uh, we are going to be featuring a talk uh, from very, very far away. Uh, we have Wallace Chase from Rianne's, uh, still one of my favorite logos for an NREN. And he is going to be talking a little bit about uh, their work in New Zealand. So I will turn it over to you, Wallace. All right. Thanks, Jason. And good morning, everyone. Although it's more morning for me here than it is for you guys, I'm glad to be with you guys here today to, to talk to you guys a little bit about Rienz and some of the unique and uh, quirky things uh, we end up doing here uh, at Rienz. Um, so to start out with, uh, my name is Wallace Chase. Uh, I am the Technical Engagement Manager for Rienz here in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. Um, some of you guys might recognize me. I was at Clemson University in the U.S. for a while, and before that I was at Washington State University. So I've been around the, been around the U.S. for a while before we decided to come over to New Zealand, because why wouldn't you come over to New Zealand? So any talk uh, that is a Rienz talk has to include both hobbits and uh, pictures of sheep. Um, so there you guys go. You're uh, good to go on that, and you have your quota of hobbits and sheep for any uh, New Zealand-based talk. I promise there won't be any more for the rest of the talk. All right, so um, when I joined Rianz about a year ago, um, uh, it was actually about two weeks after this particular article came out. Um, <laughs> so great time to uh, uh, join a network and uh, kind of frames the talk I'm going to give about some of the uh, uh, issues and struggles surrounding RIANs and some of the opportunities that that's uh, actually given us and, and the country. Um, so Hayaviki is the uh, undersea cable system uh, that feeds uh, New Zealand, the new undersea cable system. Um, and uh, when that went live, um, within a, a couple weeks of that happening, um, we actually lost three universities in membership here. Um, and I'll explain why three universities is a pretty big deal when you're um, uh, an NREN in uh, New Zealand. So uh, RIENS itself, um, we're a part of the global uh, research and education community. Um, we are the uh, NREN um, for New Zealand. Um, a lot of people um, kind of assume sometimes that uh, New Zealand is a part of uh, Australia. I certainly had that a lot when I was telling people in, in the US that, I, hey, I'm going, going to work in uh, New Zealand and, oh, Australia, uh, Sydney, no, no, not. Not exactly, big island uh, off the coast there, um, but we did blow it up a little bit on this map to make it uh, a little more uh, visible. So RIENS itself structurally, um, so we are a business owned by the government, um, and this is always a good slide to put up as to what the heck RIENS actually stands for, um, Research and Education Advanced Network New Zealand. Um, so uh, Jason uh, likes that uh, particular acronym. Um, sometimes it can be a little confusing because there's actually a real estate institute in New Zealand that has the same uh, acronym as, as RIEMS does, and it's uh, sometimes a little more well-known than we are um, out uh, once you get out of the uh, uh, higher education sector. So we report to the Minister of uh, Science and Innovation uh, and the Minister of Finance within the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment, which we call MB here. Um, we are a not-for-profit entity. We can't borrow. We have to save for reinvestment. So that includes for network refreshes. Uh, we have a board of directors appointed by the government, um, and we get government funding of around uh, two million per annum um, USD. Um, so that's only about 16% of our total revenues. The other 84% comes from our members and our services. Um, remember those numbers because they'll be important later when I'm talking about a couple things. Um, and we have approximately 27 um, uh, highly skilled uh, staff here um, from the engineering team to the engagement team to uh, corporate and all the folks that are required to be a uh, business, uh, fully operational business owned by the government. So we do uh, pretty much all the normal uh, things that an NREN does for a country. Um, so we provide uh, a base level of membership. Um, and then we have all these additional services that can be tacked on to your base uh, membership. So we do things like Cloud Connect, um, International Internet, which I'll explain in a minute here, um, Managed WAN, uh, DC Interconnect, uh, Managed Science DMZ. We have a federated identity system, um, much like in common, um, called Tuakiri um, that we operate here uh, in New Zealand, and we do a managed firewall product. We also do a lot of professional services, um, and we do development for the faucet SDN controller. 
um, that project, which uh, ESNet is one of the major users of that, um, along with Google and a couple other um, uh, companies and a bunch of other education institutions. Fawcett was originally developed um, by RIEMS and has now spun out to the uh, network research group at uh, Waikato University here in uh, New Zealand, and they do the uh, development of it uh, now as kind of an international consortium. I encourage you guys to check that out if you're interested in a SDN controller that's not from one of the big uh, companies. It's fairly lightweight um, and uh, extremely stable and, and handy. So our target sectors within uh, New Zealand, as you can see there, is uh, tertiary education, education, um, somewhat into the health uh, area. I'll explain a little bit on that later. Uh, science and innovation, uh, communications, and um, you can see the private sector is kind of uh, a little bit of an unknown there. So we do not serve uh, the private sector. We have a, uh, we are a fully um, operational uh, business entity and company, but we're owned by the government and we have a mandate to uh, only service a certain portion of the, uh, of, of our potential uh, member banks, um, which is universities and uh, polytechnics, uh, Wananga, the uh, uh, schools and uh, education institutions and private, um, private um, entities such as uh, research institutes and that that are privately funded within New Zealand. So within New Zealand, we have eight universities uh, within New Zealand, and we have seven Crown Research Institutes. Uh, Crown Research Institute is, if you could kind of uh, consider it the equivalent of like at NASA or something like that in the US. Uh, they also focus on different um, uh, sectors of research in the, uh, in the economy. Now going back up to the eight universities, there are only eight universities in New Zealand. Um, and those are where the primary, uh, primary portion of our membership dues come from, those eight universities. Um, so losing three of those universities is a, was a pretty big hit um, to RIANS um, and uh, brought about some uh, real change uh, within RIANS and within the government uh, that's still ongoing uh, here today. As I said, we also have some other um, members within um, RIANS. We have uh, polytechnics. There's actually about 16 polytechnics within New Zealand. However, there are eight that are on the RIANS network. Um, and there's actually a massive uh, restructuring in New Zealand going on right now where all of the polytechnics, all 16 of them, will be merged into one polytechnic. Um, that's ongoing at the moment, so we're watching that very closely to see what happens there. We also have a lot of independent research organization, government departments, not, not all the logos are up here, I just picked some of our bigger ones, um, that range anywhere from private research institutes like Cawthron and uh, Lincoln Agritech um, to uh, private colleges such as Whitecliffe, uh, museums, um, other uh, Pacific Edge, which is a cancer research um, uh, thing, and a couple of uh, specialty schools as well as the Ministry of Education, which is a small logo, but a fairly large portion of our, um, of our existence there. So it's a really long way to, to get to New Zealand, and that really shapes a lot of uh, RIANs and how we operate and um, some of the uh, both problems and the, and the opportunities that we have here at RIANs. Um, so if you hop on a plane in Chicago, it's about 17 hours uh, direct to get to Auckland. It's a long ways. Um, when we talk about that, um, so we are, New Zealand itself is a fairly uh, small country. So New Zealand was actually a little bit of a history lesson here. New Zealand was one of the last major inhabited land that was uh, settled on Earth. So Polynesians uh, got here about uh, 800 years ago. Um, that's not that long ago. It's fairly recent history. A little more recent to that, um, New Zealand's population density is about 18 people per square kilometer um, compared with 13 in 91. So our population has risen very rapidly, very quickly. Um, by comparison, the U.S. is about 34. And uh, New Zealand's not quite as small as people may think. It looks uh, fairly small down here in the South Pacific, but uh, when you overlay it onto a map of the US, for instance, um, it's a fairly large country, fairly spread out, um, two major islands that are not physically connected to each other. 
Um, so there, and there's a lot of interesting terrain in New Zealand for anybody who's uh, visited us or just looked at pictures and that. Um, it's uh, volcanic uh, in the north. We have major uh, earthquake fault lines running through the South Island and part of the North Island. With the, you may remember the Christchurch earthquake from a few years back. Um, and then we also have uh, the Southern Alps, a ma very major mountain range that runs along uh, both the, uh, uh, the Southern Island and then some uh, very large mountains on the North Island as well. So that creates uh, limited fiber pathways uh, and some real challenges. Um, with uh, getting connectivity around the country. And our participating organizations are spread out across the entire country. Um, so we do not have them all nice and uh, balled up in one particular area of the country. They're spread out. So the domestic network here at RIANS, um, so we are primarily a Juniper shop. We use Juniper MXs throughout our, throughout our core. Um, we have approximately 20, 22, I believe, uh, POPs around the country, so we're fairly well distributed out. Um, we are operating a 100 gig backbone as of this last year, um, and we're on the Hayuki cable system, as I said, for external connectivity. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. We operate a lot of peering and uh, caching uh, within the country. So we have uh, a couple different ways that we split up our um, our network service for our members is basically four different classifications of traffic. Um, first classification is is member to member traffic that's included in their uh, base membership um, for no additional charge above and beyond that. We then have what we call domestic internet and domestic internet. Uh, New Zealand companies have been very good um, uh, historically at being in peering exchanges and uh, you can pretty much get to the entire country and all of the internet service providers um, within uh, New Zealand through the peering exchanges. Um, that's due to the fact that international connectivity used to be extremely expensive. It's still not cheap, but used to be extremely expensive. Um, so there is an environment of kind of that interconnectivity uh, within New Zealand. We also operate uh, a bunch of caches um, from a bunch of different uh, large uh, content providers. Um, and those have been extremely well used. Um, those are probably a good quarter to uh, a third of our traffic some days um, is actually going to those um, to those caches. We also do a, an incredibly good job of monitoring our network. Um, we've been under uh, scrutiny for some time from uh, the government as a government owned entity and uh, they're very interested in how our network is performing. Um, we're actually uh, monitored for how many packets we drop on the network and things like that. Um, so we have a very good, very robust monitoring system in place on the network. So as I stated before, New Zealand's a long ways from anywhere. If you take Google Earth and center it on where I'm at in Wellington, you can only really see a couple other uh, uh, countries in this zoomed out view. Um, I will say there's a whole lot of islands to the north of New Zealand that are um, also occupied a whole lot of little countries up there, um, but uh, that's actually a separate issue to where there isn't an NREN currently that services um, that major portion of the South Pacific. Um, and both um, RIANS and uh, RNET um, along with um, Internet2 kind of in the University of Hawaii are all working um, on that problem as well um, to add connectivity um, into that area of the South Pacific. So one of our first major challenges is that New Zealand is a long ways from anywhere. International connectivity is expensive. Um, and uh, up until 2018, just last year, um, there was a monopoly cable provider um, in New Zealand. Um, so all the connectivity to New Zealand um, was provided by the Southern Cross Cable Network. Um, Southern Cross Cable Network's been around for quite a while. Um, it's one of the granddaddies of, of cables in the, in the South Pacific here. Um, and it's a very good, resilient design. It's been around since uh, 2000 when it went RFS. Um, and uh, RIANS uh, used to rely on that cable system uh, with Australia uh, as well. Now, uh, the Southern Cross cable system was for a very long time the only cable system of, of, of any size or importance that connected into um, New Zealand. They had a monopoly on the market. Um, and uh, if you notice under the owners there, Spark New Zealand. Uh, Spark New Zealand is 
one of the larger companies that was formed out of Telecom New Zealand, which was the original kind of behemoth. You can think of it as the AT&T of New Zealand at one point in time. Um, uh, that uh, that was a fairly monopoly provider um, within New Zealand. Um, the New Zealand government uh, broke up Telecom New Zealand uh, many years ago, and uh, now there are different providers that provide the underlying infrastructure um, from being able to provide services directly to consumers uh, on top of that. So we have a very uh, disaggregated system now within New Zealand uh, that provides for a lot more competition within the country. But we still do have a uh, uh, spark around that is a majority owner in that cable system, making it fairly expensive at that time. The next cable system to come live, and you can see that it just came live in 2017, so it's not that old of a cable system, was the TGA cable um, that provided access um, from uh, basically Raglan here in New Zealand over to uh, just, uh, just outside of Sydney. Um, and that was a great uh, addition to the uh, New Zealand market. It did provide a little bit of extra connectivity that was not um, uh, contained within uh, the Southern Cross cable system. Um, however, if you notice, the, the, the ownership um, there kind of speaks for itself. Um, and uh, just going to Australia meant you still were um, in the Australian telecom market um, for purchasing uh, connectivity. So the big, uh, the big new, new news for uh, New Zealand has been the Hyariki cable system. This has been a cable system that's been in the planning and been attempted to be um, uh, rfs for many, many, many years. Um, there's been three or four different attempts at um, running a new cable to New Zealand, um, and a Hyariki cable system was finally a uh, success on that. You will notice that it is owned by a, uh, by a single uh, company that simply operates the cable itself. So it is an open access uh, cable system, which is a very good, good deal for New Zealand. Now the HiWiki cable system, um, RIEMS is actually a, uh, a anchor tenant on that cable system. Um, so we have a $65 million, 25 year anchor tenant agreement on that cable system. Um, and uh, this also included $15 million contributed directly by the government um, to, fund the, uh, to fund the building of the cable. Um, without that, the cable system probably would not have gone ahead. It probably would have failed like some other attempts had. Um, so it, uh, it was uh, necessary for the government to do that. Um, RIEMS was chosen to hold the government's investment in the cable system, which is a... Uh, very good deal for New Zealand, um, but it does have some ramifications to RIEMS. Um, if you remember back to my initial slide, we're only 15% um, uh, of our revenue comes from the government. Um, that meant that a lot of that um, uh, bill is being taken up by our members directly. Um, and although it was, it's a good thing for the country, and it's a good thing uh, nationally to have and internationally to have, um, it does put, it has put a strain um, on our membership um, to be able to uh, fund that going forward. So the design of the Hawaii cable system is, is a uh, pretty good one. Um, as you can see there, it also has uh, uh, drops um, that are um, put in the cable system um, at, in New Caledonia, Fiji, and Tonga um, that are not currently in use, but uh, they're working on that right now, getting those um, in place in those countries. Um, we do, it does, however, connect into America Samoa, um, which the University of Hawaii um, is leveraging right now in a partnership uh, with Hawaii to uh, actually work on, work with the um, uh, community college and the educational institutions in America and Samoa. So as far as uh, the cable system, it's a design capacity of 43.8 terabits um, and uh, has has it, it, it's a big deal for New Zealand and provides a lot of connectivity um, into New Zealand. There is one other cable system that I will mention, which is um, as soon as the Hiviki cable system came into market, um, Southern Cross has uh, come up with a new um, cable system. If you remember, the original Southern Cross cable system is about 20 years old now, um, and they're looking at getting a replacement for that. If this cable system uh, uh, layout looks fairly familiar to you, it's uh, very similar to the uh, design of the Hariki cable system. 
um, in that it'll be able to provide uh, hopefully some of the same uh, latency that the uh, high BPK cable system can. Uh, the direct nature of it um, has shaved uh, some time off of that, um, and that's a major selling point for folks on that cable, especially very high high dollar clients, uh, such as high frequency traders and financial markets. So right now, RAMS is uh, international connectivity um, kind of looks like this on that cable system. You will notice that it's a bit of a single point of failure, um, and that is something that we're working through right now. It's figuring out how to um, resolve that single point of failure within the network. Um, the University of Hawaii, uh, through the PIRAN program and the National Science Foundation, has given us access to get from Hawaii on their, um, their connectivity to Guam. And Guam is becoming a fairly major point of connectivity in the Pacific for um, research and education networks coming in. Um, the, the Japanese, the Singaporeans, uh, Taiwan, a bunch of networks, uh, the uh, Philippine network was looking at being there as well, are starting to connect into Guam, into that exchange. Um, and uh, so we're looking at uh, bringing up that capacity here within the next year to get us to Guam. After that happens, well, then there's a whole question of how do we actually provide real resiliency back to New Zealand? There's really only two options for that, one being the uh, TGA cable system that I mentioned before that goes over to Sydney, um, or um, uh, getting some sort of deal on the uh, existing Southern Cross or the new Southern Cross uh, cable network as it comes in um, in order to provide that resiliency. Um, so we're definitely looking, looking kind of towards the west there to figure out what our paths are around um, and to get into, uh, back into New Zealand there. So this is, uh, so as I talked before, um, that it can be, it is a bit of a struggle for New Zealand. If uh, you've been kind of following along there on what I said, New Zealand is a country of about, um, as of now, about 4.9 million people. Um, we have eight universities, we have eight crown research institutions um, on the RIANS network. So we're a fairly small um, group. Um, we're about the size of, uh, you know, the state of state of Oregon or something like that, to put it into perspective in the U.S. or Colorado is another one that we're about the same size of population-wise, um, and have a decent amount of uh, universities. Um, a couple of them are fairly small, however. Um, and there's a, and a lot of that load for running not only just the network within the country, but also the international links is put upon um, those members, um, which results in a fairly, fairly high bill um, for those members. And that causes, has definitely caused some concern. It's made it so that uh, RIAN has really had to work very hard um, to explain its value proposition um, to the membership and to make sure that folks um, uh, understand why we're here and what we're doing and what the good is for. Um, it's also started a bunch of discussions within government as far as how RIANS is funded um, and that sometimes funding that's for the greater good, um, it can be very hard to get out of uh, uh, the, the, the members themselves um, when they don't necessarily see the value of that as easily. Um, a lot of the um, RIANS's bill, as, as many um, bills for uh, research connectivity are done, is paid for by the IT departments. Um, and IT departments all over are under increasing uh, pressures for, um, for funding. Um, and uh, sometimes the RIANS bill can be seen as one that would be easy to get rid of without a whole lot of loss of service. So talking about engagement here for a second, because engagement is one of the ways that we have, uh, increased engagement has been one of the ways that we've, uh, I wouldn't say solved these problems, but started to work on them. Um, and I will say that there is no easy way to do engagement. Um, and there's particularly no easy way to do engagement um, in New Zealand. It does take a lot of boots on the ground um, and really wearing the soles off your shoes, um, going around being in the universities and in our membership and, and talking to them. First step on, on that um, for myself and some others has been to, um, the engagement team here has been to build trust uh, within the IT staff. Um, we, we can't do it without them, period. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a big task. A lot of the, there's not that many universities uh, in New Zealand, as I've said before, and uh, the IT staff uh, in those universities tends to come out of the commercial sector. Um, so it is a very much a constant education program 
on what a, what a research network is, what the value of it is, um, and how to utilize it. We do a lot of work um, explaining uh, the differences between us and commercial telcos. When the Hawiki cable system went live here in New Zealand, one thing it did was drive down the cost of commodity internet considerably. Um, so whereas the cost of commodity internet was in the uh, 20s, 30s, $40 per megabit range um, just a few years ago, um, it is now down in the um, uh, you know, six to eight uh, dollars per megabit um, range, um, which is still expensive for folks in the U.S., but it is, uh, uh, we're, on a, we're on an island in the South Pacific here, so there are some additional costs. Um, but as that happened, um, RIENS was actually um, in a contract um, through uh, RNET and through the Southern Cross cable system um, to provide its connectivity there that was a fixed uh, contract, and that was uh, difficult to um, deal with because the costs in New Zealand um, uh, crashed very rapidly um, on that and uh, the contract was a fixed contract that we couldn't necessarily uh, duck out of. But when the market changed, we weren't able to adjust to it quite as easily as uh, some of the commercial providers um, were. So that has caused some um, issues within New Zealand here and within our membership, but now with our new connectivity and the ability to control our own destiny a little bit more, um, that's definitely been uh, well worth it, but it has put pressure on us um, from that market perspective of the fact that the cost of internet went down considerably. And if we have uh, folks, especially folks from uh, commercial backgrounds who haven't been well versed in what an NREN is and what the services are we provide and what the difference is, they can very easily go out and look at the market and say, well, you guys are way, way, way more expensive. Um, than uh, orders of magnitude more expensive than if I went out and uh, used a Spark or a Vodafone or a Two Degrees or some other network here in New Zealand. So it's been really on us to uh, prove our value um, to the community and to prove our uh, value um, uh, out to our membership. One of the interesting things here in New Zealand is a lot of times um, uh, research networks, NRENs and that, will talk a lot about uh, big halo projects. Um, an example of a big halo project for me would be one like the uh, CERN uh, Super Collider Superconductor and um, the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, those types of very large uh, science experiments that require huge amounts of data that is um, often uh, continuously streamed. New Zealand doesn't have a lot of researchers that are uh, super actively involved in those projects at the moment. Um, there are certainly a ton of researchers that are utilizing the data from them, um, but not necessarily the raw data, the large amounts of data. We're not exactly in a prime location in the world to be doing large amounts of, of computation um, or storage of data. We're not uh, really on the way to anywhere else um, when it comes down to it. So it is a um, it is a uh, issue there that we don't necessarily have any of those large scale projects. Um, New Zealand was a part of the initial design of the square kilometer array, um, but when it came down to actually um, becoming a full member and utilizing the square kilometer array as it, as it starts to get built now, um, the New Zealand government actually made the decision to drop out of that uh, project at that point. Um, because we just simply, it was, it was thought that there just simply aren't enough uh, radio astronomers in New Zealand to uh, utilize the government's investment in that project. So New Zealand science tends to be a lot uh, smaller uh, data sets. There's a lot of genome work going on. There's a lot of uh, visual astronomy. There is some radio astronomy as well. We have a uh, 20 meter uh, dish here in New Zealand. Um, so there is a lot of data, but it doesn't tend to be these very large halo projects um, it tends to be a lot of smaller stuff, folks moving files, um, you know, up to a tera in size um, and doing it uh, infrequently, not necessarily um, continuous streams of traffic. Um, so there's a, that makes it uh, more difficult to explain um, sometimes why our links don't always look very full um, and to explain the bursty nature of our traffic. And, and that's the very reason that we exist. I also mentioned earlier that we have a very good monitoring systems in place, and that has been critical, critical to being able to show our value um, to our members and to the government, um, is being able to show those monitoring systems, to be able to show those microbursts, to be able to show um, how, how good the network is when people do transfer data. 
um, even if they aren't transferring large streams of data all the time, 24 seven. Um, so getting back here to engagement for a second, um, one of the things uh, when I, as I said, I came in um, when the three universities uh, left us there. So one of my first tasks was to get out um, into the community and get to know um, our members uh, very well. Um, typically, this is something that um, NRENs and that don't have to do quite as much as we have to do here. Um, we really needed to get out and uh, be a part of the universities, get to know the IT staff um, from the engineers all the way up to the C CEOs and uh, CIOs and the uh, vice chancellors. Um, and that required a lot of us being on the ground um, in, the, in the universities, talking to folks um, and doing that. Over the last uh, few years, uh, Rianz has only had um, one person in the engagement role. And with our membership, that just simply wasn't enough. He did a wonderful job, but he wasn't able to be everywhere all the time and talk to enough people. Um, so that's where me and another engagement person were brought on in the last uh, year here to do that. Um, I've taken kind of an interesting uh, twist on that. One of the first things we did when we moved here to New Zealand was to buy an ex-airport shuttle van and rip out the interior and convert it into a camper van. Um, so there's a big, a uh, lot of people uh, do uh, camper vans here in New Zealand. It's very popular. There's a lot of free places to camp and, and uh, camper van parks is very, uh, in, the, in the summer you'll see hundreds of these on the road. Um, so we went ahead and did it ourselves. We built ourselves a camper van and um, actually gone on a couple of road trips. Uh, one was uh, about a full month where we, uh, uh, me and my wife and the dog will pack up and we'll just go around and spend about a week at each one of the universities um, and uh, do some real in-depth engagement, get to know the folks uh, on the engineering teams and the IT teams, storage teams, um, the, get to know the scientists, get to know the uh, folks at the university and really just do some in-depth uh, work there um, by being a part of the university, by being a part of their team um, and uh, sitting with them for a week or two at a time. Uh, and I try to do that um, as, as often uh, as we can. So it's also led to a pretty decent lifestyle for myself uh, and, and my family. Um, we've enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, it allows us to um, kind of do what we want to do as far as that's concerned, but also um, serve uh, RIENs and uh, the uh, research community here in New Zealand at the same time. So this is kind of an interesting thing that just came up in the last little while here. We did a survey um, of our membership. We do this uh, once a year and it's a pretty uh, intensive uh, survey and where we put a lot of effort into it to uh, maintain a pulse on what our, what our uh, members are looking at and what they're doing. And this kind of speaks to a couple different things here. Um, one is uh, you can tell that the, you can just kind of tell from the, the, the diagram here that most of the folks who responded to this were in the IT um, departments. Um, we did not have a lot of um, uh, necessarily researchers. As I said, we don't have a lot of those large halo projects. So the researchers here in New Zealand, um, there's a lot of work to be done that we're doing to educate them on what RIANS is and what the possibilities are of data transfers and international collaborations and those types of things. Um, typically in uh, networks, when you have those very large users, they end up having to get in touch with the network folks. They end up having to get in touch with that and uh, end up there. A lot of the smaller um, or more bursty users of the network from the science perspective are a lot harder to find. Uh, it takes a lot more work to go out and find them. Um, and it takes a very different uh, conversation with them um, around it because they are getting by often by shipping their hard drives around um, in the post or by, um, you know, uploading massive files in very strange ways um, and transferring stuff around um, in, in ways that would make a network engineer cringe. Often they're, they're getting by just fine with that, um, uh, but they could, explaining to them what, what could be, if they could improve their workflows, if they could streamline things, they could make it so you didn't have to wait um, three or four weeks for that hard drive to go to the UK and come back. Um, if you didn't have to fly over to uh, the Australian synchrotron every time you wanted to run a sample, if you could just send the uh, sample uh, over there electronically and get the results electronically, those kind of conversations um, are constantly happening. Um, and we 
can't necessarily rely on the IT departments within the universities in particular to have those conversations. Um, as I said, they tend to be very uh, enterprise uh, oriented, although a couple of the uh, our universities are starting to see that um, there's a real future in helping out the researchers and that it is a very important thing. Um, so it's kind of a two pronged approach. One is to um, upskill and uh, inform the IT departments, um, but also at the same time, um, we as REANs can't really wait for them to get fully up to speed and on board. We have to start working with the researchers directly right now, um, which can uh, be a very, sometimes a delicate balance of, of how much you um, do within a university and making sure you keep everybody in the loop and informed, make sure that the IT department and the research offices are comfortable with what you're doing and understand that, and a lot of that is relationship-wise. So as I said, the interesting thing here from this, it kind of shows that, that there's a fairly low amount of people uh, interested in data transfer nodes and multi-partner collaborations, lots of people inf interested in information security, cloud services, mostly on the enterprise side there, um, network refreshes, that sort of thing. Uh, IDM um, is always a pain in, in a lot of people's uh, side um, within IT departments. Um, but this is kind of eye-opening in that regard and just shows that we have a lot of work to do there. The nice thing is that we're not alone um, necessarily in that charge here in New Zealand. Um, we have uh, the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure Group uh, that is also working on these same things. So New Zealand has a centralized HPC infrastructure for its research community. And not everybody necessarily uses it. There's a lot of folks using other services, but this is uh, by far the biggest one um, that's actually hosted at uh, NIWA, which is kind of our equivalent of uh, NOAA that uh, does uh, weather forecasting, climate modeling, that sort of stuff. So they had a need for a big machine um, and uh, kind of went into conjunction with uh, the Nessie group to build a machine that was much larger than the climate modelers needed, um, but uh, was still um, a single uh, uh, facility. Um, so there are some economies of scale there. Um, and be able to uh, service a lot of the community there. So the uh, Nessie group has been working very hard um, alongside REANs to deploy, um, to, to, to get data in and out of this new supercomputing center. Um, and one of the things we've done with that is we've, they have a partnership with Globus and we've been deploying Globus around uh, New Zealand pretty, uh, pretty rapidly. It's been a pretty rapid uptake actually in it considering we've only been doing it for about the last six months or so in a big way. Um, but as the new center has come online, this HPC center has only been online in this capacity with these machines for about six months now. Um, there's definitely been a need in a, 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 to get uh, more large data sets in and out of this machine. So with that, we've been working with uh, Nessie. Nessie's gotten these four nodes uh, deployed right off the bat. We've got a couple of our other members um, coming on board as well. Um, not all, not all uh, REANS users are Nessie users, but all Nessie users are REANS users. Um, so we're kind of covering off the ones where there's overlap uh, first, and then uh, moving on to a bunch of our other um, infrastructure providers there. So the, the, the good news in all of this is I started the presentation with a kind of a downer slide and um, we, we have made progress um, and I won't say that's all um, due to um, the works of necessarily the engagement team. There's a lot of stuff going on in government and that, but it is uh, all due to the fact, all due to engagement in general, um, engaging with the community, talking with them, um, uh, getting government engaged, getting uh, funding agencies engaged, getting everyone engaged, putting them all at the table and saying, okay, this is a very good thing for the nation. Um, how do we uh, fund it uh, going forward? How do we make it sustainable? Um, and how do we um, do that? RIANS is part of the table, really has been in, in explaining the value proposition of RIANS, of an NREN, of a research network, um, and explaining that with, with data, with examples, um, where, um, where we've done, a, I think, a very good job of that so far. And just to kind of close out here, I, I totally lied to you. Here's another uh, picture of both hobbits and sheep. And I, I kind of like this because, um, so the original Hobbiton movie set that's here in New Zealand, 
um, when they shot the first movie, the farmer who owned the place, um, uh, you know, and how he had this movie set, these hobbit holes on his land. Um, and of course, what does any good farmer, sheep farmer do with it? Um, he made them into sheep houses. Um, and, um, and that worked very well um, for, for a little while. But then he very rapidly, once the uh, Lord of the Rings movies and The Hobbit came out and it became more and more popular and a worldwide phenomenon, he realized that he could make some money um, off of this and uh, worked with Peter Jackson to kind of refurbish and, and build out the uh, movie set to what it looked like during the movie filmings. And now he makes a ton more money um, on bringing tourists to the site um, than if he would have uh, just uh, left it as uh, cheap. Um, Cheap sheds. So that's my discussion. Um, I uh, definitely uh, welcome any questions that you guys may have about um, about Rians, about the work we're doing here, about some of the unique things, or uh, just about uh, New Zealand in general, because it is a uh, it's a great place to be. Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you, Wallace. Uh, really great. Um, so if anybody does have any questions that they want to type in or if you're in a quiet spot and want to ask them, uh, feel free to do so. I wrote down a couple here to, to sort of get us started. Uh, along the lines of your, your observation that, you know, you don't have a lot of people involved in the, the, the capstone or sort of the halo educational projects, uh, are you finding that the, the research activity really is almost exclusively with the, the smaller not necessarily smaller uh, to be pejorative, but smaller science in terms of, you know, it's an individual research group working with an instrument that they may own or may share with some others. And then as a result of that, they're going off and doing their own storage and their own computation, mostly because they, they learn that they can't use networks, you know, because everything is far away. Is that sort of the common thing that you're seeing? So I would say that's more common than not. Um, New Zealand uh, having this type of, so RIANS is a fairly young network. We've only been around in our current capacity for about eight years. Um, and what we were really started um, kind of differently than some of the networks uh, that I'm familiar with in the U.S. A lot of the networks in the U.S. kind of sprung out of need and necessity um, and were really pushed from either the IT perspective within universities um, or were pushed uh, from the researchers themselves, and that kind of grew and spread from there. Within New Zealand, the, um, it really came more as we need to have an NREN as a country. Um, this is a good thing, and we need to use that NREN and uh, organizations like NESI to spur on e-research within the country. Um, so when connect so there is a kind of because connectivity has been historically very expensive in New Zealand, um, not only to um, universities, but to uh, just to your house, there is still kind of that view that connectivity is an extremely expensive, limited thing. Um, and that is a viewpoint that we're definitely working very hard to break down and to dissuade that is no longer all that, ex well, it's kind of expensive still, but not, not to the end users. Um, and it is more or less unlimited for them. Um, we have a lot of capacity and they can do that. So there are a lot of researchers, especially ones who have been around for you know, more than 10 years, who definitely did not start out having good connectivity. Connectivity was very limited, very slow, quotas on internet connections and stuff like that. That's one thing that you'll still see, uh, especially in like hotels and stuff here. So you'll, you'll get a gig of internet um, in that. And, and that's kind of that historical uh, context coming through where connectivity was very limited and very expensive in the past. The other thing, too, is that just our physical location um, in the world means that we're not necessarily on anybody's radar for um, being a major part um, hardware wise, I guess I'll say hardware and infrastructure wise, of anyone's large scale projects. Um, so we have a lot of researchers that are very much top in their field working with. Um, with all these large scale research projects around the world. It's not that we don't have people in them. Um, it's just they tend not to be in the path infrastructure wise. They tend to be utilizing the results or utilizing the project in different ways, but not necessarily bringing in raw data or, or computing it here. Um, our our supercompute center is uh, decently sized um, for the country, but it's not a, a, a giant center um, like you would see um, else places in the world, and it's fairly unlikely that New Zealand would ever have a giant uh, size uh, computer cluster here. 
Um, so because we don't have those resources, it does kind of put a strain on that. So there's really, <laughs> to summarize my rambling, there's really two things. Um, one is getting the community, both IT and the researchers, to realize that they can do these things. Um, and um, also just the fact that we don't, um, that we don't have those large scale projects here um, in, in country. Okay, thank you. And I, I guess another question, and you may, you've answered it a little bit, but I, I kind of want to uh, explore it a little bit more. Um, I, I, I don't remember if you said it or not, but does Rayanne's, uh, the first part of the question is, does Rayanne's carry, I guess you don't carry any commercial traffic, so for the, the dorms and stuff of the major universities, are you carrying things that you would see in a, in a typical U.S. dorm, you know, your Netflix and your Hulu via a commodity peering service? And if you're not carrying that stuff, uh, does, does that sort of lack of having to worry about the commercial side uh, change any way that you guys would operate versus something like Sea Light here in the U.S. or any of the other uh, uh, state networks and state runs uh, f from not having to worry about that sort of uh, uh, dorm room traffic profile? So we we do actually carry all of that traffic. We're a complete service provider for for our members who who, who desire us to be. Um, but that only happened about four or five years ago, where Rians uh, finally started to uh, provide what I'll call commodity internet services as well. Um, and that was part of that um, agreement between Southern Cross, RNet, and and, and Rians there. The problem with that was that we were, um, in order to do that, um, Rians uh, signed a contract to, to do that with the Southern Cross Network, um, and that was a fairly expensive contract based on the prices in Australia. The commercial environment, in the meantime, changed rapidly um, in New Zealand. The prices dropped out, um, but we were in a fixed uh, contract. Pricing-wise, so our commodity internet um, has been very expensive, um, but now with the Hibiki cable system and, and us being at the end of that contract with Southern Cross, we've been able to drop those prices considerably. Um, we have, however, I mean, our international pops have only been up for about a year. Um, so this is the first time we've had an international presence ourselves and haven't been reliant on another network such as uh, RNet to provide that international presence which they did a great job of doing. It's just a different uh, commercial environment for us than what, what they have. Um, so we're, we're very active right now getting peering uh, set up in those uh, international places. So we are in the uh, six exchange uh, along with the Pacific Northwest Gigapop in, in Seattle. Um, and then we're in uh, the Equinox uh, data center in Sydney. Um, and we're looking at being in a couple other places as well as, as things allow. So we're looking at getting those peerings up because right now a lot of that commodity traffic, um, we have to pay a, another commercial service provider, in this case we pay Vodafone, um, to take a lot of that traffic. Um, the caches have been a major, major boon for us. They've been very good um, because we have a Netflix cache, a Facebook cache, an Akamai cache, and a Google cache, um, and those get used a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and the fact that they are within New Zealand means that we can offer that connectivity um, at no cost to our members. Um, they only pay for, basically with Rians, you only pay for connectivity to the commercial internet um, if it has to go overseas and we have to uh, transit it across the Tasman or across the Pacific um, and it's not going to another NREN, um, that's where we actually um, have to pay for that and then we pass that cost back down onto the membership. Um, and we're trying to drive that cost down as much as possible by doing peerings and that sort of stuff um, to where it's lower cost to us so we can pass on less cost to the members. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll pause here. I don't see anybody typing any questions yet, but if anybody does have anything that they want to type or ask, uh, feel free to do so. All right, we may be at the end here. Uh, so thanks again, Wallace. Uh, really great stuff. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you here in the States uh, for one of the community meetings uh, not too long. Otherwise, uh, those of you that attend APAN, I'm sure you'll see Wallace there. Um, Absolutely. 
and uh, send me your slides when you get a chance. I'll make sure that those get posted. And for everybody who's still on, uh, next week's talk is going to be Nick Broglio from ESNet, and I think he's doing disruptive technologies, uh, probably talking a little bit about Fawcett. So if you wanted to know more about uh, Fawcett and Rayans, I'm sure Nick will mention it a little bit. So uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, thanks again for staying or getting up early on a Saturday, Wallace, and we'll talk to you all soon.